My name's Julian Mather. I'm a professional motivational speaker and I'm just about to be on the Prosperity Show. So if you tune in, you're going to uh, hear this joke. So uh, an army sniper, a magician and a globe-trotting cameraman walk into a bar. No joke, I've been all three. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I did to make the zigzag journey through life. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show, where we bring you stories of remarkable individuals that are shaping their worlds and changing lives. And today, we've got a guest who's not your average storyteller. He's been a magician, an army sniper, and even a globe-trotting TV cameraman. Quite a resume, right? So I'm here to welcome Julian. Now, Julian, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm really, really happy to be here. Really, really happy to talk about anything you want to talk about, Prosper. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. I was just looking at your resume from magic to being a sniper and moving around with a camera. But now you're the one in front of the camera. So for those that are watching right now, just hold on to your seats because Julian Mother isn't just any other storyteller. He's a master of transformation himself. I want you to get spellbound because I think this promises to be one of those most captivating episodes yet. Now, Julian, you've worn a lot of hats in your career from, like we say, ma a magician to an army sniper to a cameraman. Now, tell us a little bit about your story and what it is you're working on currently. Yeah, so it, look, I've really got to go back to when I was about eight years old because my earliest memories were going to speech therapy lessons because I was a stutterer. And I stuttered in my youth, into my teens, into my 20s, into my 30s, and I hated it. <laughs> and I eventually you know, had to make some changes around that. But the reason I, I start there is because my first career was as an army sniper and a lot of people go well you know that's odd what's the connection well the, the, there's a real through line to everything i've done particularly in my first couple of decades of different careers and that was i had no self-confidence whatsoever because my stuttering what i learned from my stuttering was it made people very, very uncomfortable. People get embarrassed when they're around a stutterer. They don't know how to react to it. So I was not just a stutterer. I was a people pleaser. I've always been a people pleaser. To this very day, I'm a people pleaser. So I worked out that if I opened my mouth and spoke, it made people uncomfortable and I wanted to please them. So the easiest thing to do was not open my mouth. And this magnified itself over the years into low confidence, low self-esteem. And so the reason that an army sniper was so attractive to me, that career, was I could go and hide away and not have to speak to anybody. And so it was literally I could hide behind this piece of technology and if somebody wanted you know, to speak to me, it was like a big sign professional at work, do not disturb. And uh, look, I did that for three years. It was not the career or the future that I saw myself doing it. I learned so many things doing that. I learned all about personal responsibility. This all helped me. But what I wanted to be was a photojournalist. Ever since I was young, that's what I wanted to be. And I left the army and I went into television and I was a documentary cameraman. Now there's a real similarity <laughs> between being a documentary cameraman and being an army sniper. And you know, there's different things you could talk about. Oh, well, you know, you're, sh you're shooting something, there's focus there, you know, there's a whole lot of things. But, but the commonality with me was I could hide behind the camera again. I had just swapped one piece of technology to hide behind to have another piece of technology to hide behind. And even though I had a wonderful job, I mean, I what I called the second best job in the world, 
Uh, they literally put a plane ticket in one hand, money in the other. They kicked me out the door and they said, go tell people stories. And I loved it. So I was out there telling stories, but the story I never told anybody was a story that was going on inside my head. And that was, I was so embarrassed because all these people who were in front of my lens, who were affecting change in the world, I wanted to do what they were doing, but I had none of the confidence to do that. And I was mystified. How did they actually do that? Like, what did they know that I didn't know? Uh, and I felt uh, uh, excluded because something that I've learned over the years is those people who are in the light, so, you know, like literally in front of the lens or on the stage, get afforded more opportunity than those people who decide to stay in the shadows. And then I felt small because I really felt I could be playing a much bigger game. So this was a story that was in my head. And over the years, what I did was people thought that I was making videos and I was, <laughs> yeah. but what I was really doing was studying people. I had a unique laboratory because as a documentary cameraman, what you actually are is a professional starer. You get to stare at people for hours at a time. And then unlike say just working on news where you might you know you're in and out within a couple of hours documentary work i might be with people for a day a week a month weeks over years and you what i was looking for was patterns and i used to study all these patterns and i saw a whole lot of things these people were doing and over the years what i've distilled it down to is is three simple things that uh, successful people do. And when I say successful, I've got to be really careful on that. Is a, There's different metrics of success. It's not just money. We typically go to, to money. But there's, you know, uh, it could be academic, it could be personal, it could be social metrics of success. Uh, and my own personal metric of success is lack of regret. I mean, I can go into any room and be with all these high flyers. I'm not particularly uh, wealthy at all, but when it comes to lack of regret, there are few people in that room who, who can challenge me or top me. Uh, seriously, Prosper, if we finish this and you hear that I got run over by the bus, you know that I died a very happy and content person. Uh, I'm, I'm rich beyond belief with lack of regret. Uh, but anyway, that, you, this has fascinated me that I saw all these people doing all these things that I wanted to do. So then over a period of time, I've started to apply that myself. And I've realized that if I did the simple steps that they did, things started to change for me. And then I started showing other people and they started doing it and things started changing for them. And that's sort of where I've ended up now. What I do is I talk about what I talk, call changeability. It's the ability to change. And why do we need that? Because the world has forgotten to teach us how to change. I mean, change is demanded of us. Business demands change, organizations demand change, our family demands change. But think about it. Have you ever been taught to change? Simple, change 101. No, everyone just assumes that we know how to do it. And I've got a very, very simple way of distilling this down to making a real change for real people made real simple. And that's what I do now. I go out and I speak about that. So it's a bit of a long-winded story, but uh, <laughs> here we are. Absolutely. And thank you so much for taking us on that journey. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your service. Um, it's not every day that you come across somebody who's actually been in maybe, you know, the sniper side of things and now very humble and can hold a conversation with somebody after what you say you've been through now take us back to that time when you were eight year old eight, eight years old and you know you were going through speech therapy and things like that what was what was it like being around other kids um you know of your own age was it easy for you to make friends or be around them without them maybe noticing because kids notice these things 
Oh, kids notice, yeah. No, I, look, Prosper, my, my childhood was no better or worse than anyone's, anyone else's. I mean, everyone has a burden to carry of some sort. Most of the times we can't see it. Most of the time that burden is, is hidden. Mine happened to have uh, an audio and visual uh, cue. And of course, I mean, I got teased mercilessly as a kid. So how did I respond to that? By, by not talking. I mean, like a lot of people, you know, me, characteristically, I'm shy. You would go, you know, most people who know me growing up go, I can't believe you're out on stage they're talking now because you were such a shy, quiet person. Yes, I was, but inside I wanted to do and be some somebody else. Uh, but that was my su survival, uh, you know, a coping strategy was not to talk. Absolutely, and uh, I can imagine you know, you know, those are really formidable years for any, you know, kid growing up. And that's when self-awareness sort of kicks in. I was actually thinking you went on and took on that job just so you could get back to anyone else that made fun of you during that time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You know, like it's one of those things, isn't it? Like it's a, it's sort of a handy skill to have in your back pocket, but it's a, it's not it's not one that you'd ever really want to sort of have have to bring out, or or if you did bring it out, it's not it's not one you'd go and tell anyone about. But absolutely, now you know the oxymoron about all of this for somebody who didn't say much, you wanted to tell stories. What was it like when you had to actually then go in and help these people during documentaries? and maybe direct them and tell them how to sort of act when you, in actual fact, didn't feel, like you said, um, worthy or sort of the person that deserved that sort of space? Yeah, very much, very much so. So one of the, the things was that my, my desire to be a storyteller was early on, like, I've got a visual eye. And I tell stories originally through pictures. That 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 was my strength. I, I could use pictures to tell stories. Traditional storytelling, as in you know, standing up and recounting a story to somebody, I was so bad at. I can I cannot tell you how bad I was. And do you know why I was bad? Because I didn't speak to anybody. And it's it it is like. It's like saying that you're going to learn to ride a, a, a bike by reading a book or flying a plane by reading a book. You know, you, you don't, or swimming by reading a book. You've got, actually got to jump in the pool. And I hadn't jumped in the pool because I didn't speak to people. So I actually found as a storyteller, I was way behind uh, the pack for a long time. So I balanced that out by being very good visually and then over the time, I was just working side by side with very good storytellers using very good tactics and very and, and a lot of discipline around story. And just I got interested and um, uh, I listened and I learned and I tried. And just over time, <laughs> I've improved now to the point now where I'm a um, reasonably good storyteller. But certainly in, in my early days, Prosper, I never thought I would be able to, to do that. I mean, all these things I'm, I'm doing now, even sitting here talking to you and just doing it in a way where I'm, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm just going, well, Prosper's asked me a question. I'm going to reply. Honestly, I never thought that I would be able to do that. Uh, but there, but there you go. If you, you know, you show up and uh, you're willing to be imperfect, and you, uh, you know, put the effort in, uh, we can do a lot more than we think we're capable of. I must commend you because you know, from what you're telling me, and from the kind of boy you would have been, there must have been a lot of work, personal development, and <laughs> literally magic to bring you to where you are because so many people, I think it was um, Seinfeld uh, who mentioned this, that some people would rather be the person in the coffin than actually be the person that's saying the eulogy and you've transcended all of that, you know, given what you started off 
as um you know what 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 would you say is the biggest fire to you being who you are right now i mean i know you've said that so, you're seeing people what, but yeah yeah so look one of those patterns you know when i said i was staring through the lens and i was looking at patterns one of the things i noticed was that when we were working with people again who were successful again by many measures and and metrics there was this commonality we would ask them oh can we come around and um you know film a sequence with you tonight oh no i can't i'm out doing this um oh okay well, what about tomorrow morning no tomorrow morning i'm doing this and i worked out that a lot of extraordinary people are actually just quite regular people and me i i've got no you know when i've got a few skills and a few talents that i've worked on but i found that with most people who we say oh they're so extraordinary okay so what i worked out was extraordinary people are ordinary people who do extra and this is what I saw. These were regular people when I hung around with them behind the scenes. And you thought, oh, they're struggling with their family at home, just as I'm struggling with my family. Oh, they've got financial problems. They've got worries and fears and anxiety too. But you know what they do? They just turn up more than other people do. They turn up earlier and they go home later. And that was a huge, huge insight for me because I'm a very average person at my base level. And I thought if I'm willing to turn up more than other people are, it means I'm in with a shot at this. And that one thing is like any successes I've had, I would say, I have outlasted people <laughs> competition more than it's been um, uh, based upon skills or talent. Oh, absolutely. And and I quite like that because uh, I can't quite remember who mentioned this, but when you can recognize patterns, you know, pattern recognition is something that very few people have. And when you can now you know, look at the cause and effect of certain things. You literally can reverse engineer a lot of things. And Steve Jobs mentioned that you cannot connect the dots looking forward, but you can connect the dots looking backwards. Now, you were about to allude that you rubbed shoulders with greats and um, notorious people alike. Now, could you maybe give us a glimpse into maybe one of the most memorable encounters that you would have had during your globe trotting adventures. Like you say, they are people too, you know, and the great level is we all go to the toilet after every meal. Okay. So he, he, here's one that's fairly topical at the moment. Uh, oh, this would have been 15, 16, 17 years ago. Uh, I flew to San Francisco, uh, hired a car and drove about 10 kilometers down the road to a suburb called San Bruno. And we drove up to this large warehouse slash factory. And uh, on the facade were five letters that I had never seen before and made no sense to me at all. T-E-S-L-A. Right, so we were there doing a story. This was on the early days of electric cars. And in we go and we looked at the sheet and we've got this interview with this guy with a very, very strange name, Elon Musk. What sort of a name is that? Anyway, we were sort of waiting around, we get ready and this entourage of people comes with this guy in front and he is really angry. He is saying to all these people, his entourage around, I have told you to stop you know, booking me like this. I don't have time to do these things like this. And so we had traveled across the Pacific and they're meeting this guy who's basically saying to us, I don't wanna be here with you. And it was Elon Musk in the early days of Tesla. So what i did with elon was right at the start one, one, one of the things i've learned a lot about working with with people and this thing that you know you were just mentioning we're all the same and so it's very i find it very easy 
to talk to anybody and just talk to them at, at, a, at a very base human level. So I said to Eli, I didn't know his name, I you know, I just said, Look, just, just come over here. And we walked over to the side and we just leant against a, a steel bench. And I went, listen, it's really clear that you don't want to be here. And he nodded. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to let you in on a secret. I don't want to be here either. Right? <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> I didn't want to be around someone who was angry. So I said, look, how's this? If you do exactly what I tell you, instead of an hour, I'll get you out of here in 35 to 40 minutes. How does that sound? And he just looked at me and said, okay, done. Now, the re this is one of the things I learned with working with people is that, and, and also um, because I did five years as a professional magician and I learned a lot about audiences. And here's the thing. People actually like to be directed. They like to be told what to do. As long as you have established early on with them that you have the credibility and the likability to be able to do that, which is what I did with Elon. I just went and talked to him very one-on-one, -on -one, no messing around, very short sentences. And he looked at me and said, this guy knows what, what he's doing. It's the same thing when you're on stage, you're working with an audience because you can go on stage and think, oh, this audience seems really hostile. They're not smiling. They don't like me. But this is what's going through the audience's head is they're going, you know what? My life is really busy. This is a, a subconscious uh, discussion they're having. My life's really busy. I've got to pick the kids up when this is finished and I've got to get milk and then I've got to make sure I'm back for that meeting. And they're thinking all day long, I have to make decisions. And if you go on stage and you can convince people that you're in control, that you'll take them on a journey for, say, 30 minutes, you know what they do? They go, oh, you take over. I don't have to think for 30 minutes. And that's what people want. They want to give their, their brains a rest. And that's exactly what happened with Elon back there. He just assessed, you know what, I've got enough to deal with. This guy says he can save me 25 minutes over, over to you. So, uh, you know, uh, understanding that deep down people want that direction. And if you can show up confidently and give that direction to them, they actually thank you for it. Wow. Now that's a story and a half. <laughs> and, you know, for viewers, like I told you, this was going to be one episode for the books. Don't forget to subscribe because you never know what you're going to find on the online prosperity show. I, I think that's a huge, huge, huge story. And, um, you know, obviously I now see why you say you've got no regrets. I mean, you've met, you've met one of the richest people in the world and you've just realized, you know what? He's just like any one of us. He also likes direction, just like any other normal, regular person out there. And, I, and, I, and I'll tell you how much I considered him a regular person. This story I've only been telling for about 18 months because I had essentially forgotten it. <laughs> and, some, and somebody was going through and they said, what do you look? You've got to have written about Elon Musk. And they said, why aren't you talking about that? And I went, oh, you're right. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. Mm. I, I like this. I like this. And um, you, you alluded a little bit to how you actually use magic. So there you are, a sniper, cameraman, and you also have the technology of magic. And it just really um, has something to do with being behind some form of a technology, you know, and uh, uh, this in and of itself is, 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 is something remarkable. Now see? You see, you've, you've, you've picked up on the pattern there. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> well, absolutely. There's, there's a bit of a pattern of being behind something because like you said, yeah. you're a visual sort of storyteller with magic. It's, it's telling a story without you even having to say anything and letting the aesthetics of it all uh, mesmerize somebody. And then they can conclude that story by themselves. Now, how has this now, obviously using all these diverse backgrounds, you know, really, really aided you with your keynotes and the work that you're working on now? 
Okay, so I'm going to have to just expand this out a little bit to give this some context. So if I go back to where I was a cameraman, where I was the professional starer, where I was looking at people for patterns, uh, there were these people who influenced me. Uh, and there was one person, his name was PC Waddington, Police Constable Graham Waddington. This was in England. I was shooting a documentary in a very disadvantaged area called Banbury over there. Uh, and this school called Drayton Comprehensive was a really tough school. And PC Waddington was stationed at the school. That was that was his office every day he went to work. Now, to give you an idea about the school, it was called Drayton Comprehensive. Uh, it's where Gordon Ramsay, the celebrity chef, went to school. And if you know Gordon Ramsay, you know, he does those Hell's Kitchens and stuff and the extra, he like he swears a lot. He really like lippy and, and an angry person. So you imagine this school full of about 400 of 15 to 17 year old little angry Gordon Ramsay's. That, that was what the school was, was like. And so I was filming this PC Graham, Graham Waddington talking to this class about uh, substance abuse. It was basically aerosol sniffing. They had a, you know, they're bringing the deodorants to school and, and putting them up their nose. And I was in the back of the room. He was in the front of the room with this group of 15 year olds. And he was just talking and telling stories to these kids and everybody came under his spell. He was just amazing. He wasn't talking at them. He was just talking with them. And then the bell rang and all these kids had their bags in the, in the classroom with them and the desk and the chairs just scattered as they headed to the next room. And from where I was at the back of the room, I was the only person who saw this. Three kids walked past his desk without saying a thing and reached into their bag, pulled out a can of aerosol, left it on the desk and just left the room. And I went, wow, because in my time as a cameraman, I had witnessed well-meaning government programs that had spent millions of well-meaning dollars, but didn't actually do much. Yet here was one man standing in front of a group of kids for about 25 minutes who stopped three kids sniffing aerosols that day. And something went off in my head. I said, one day I'm going to be doing this. <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know where, I don't know how, but this whole idea of direct action and working with kids just resonated with me. So we fast forward quite a few years and I walked away from my TV career. I was at the top of my game after 25 years and I just walked away and I took a program into schools to teach philanthropy to school children. It was a resounding failure. After 18 months of pushing this program and pushing it and pushing it, I could not get people interested. And I learned my first lesson about business. Never open a restaurant unless you've got a starving crowd. And nobody out there wanted kids to learn about philanthropy. The teachers in the schools all said, it's really wonderful. What a great idea. But have you got anything based around the maths curriculum? Have you got anything based around English or science? And that's, I told you that story is because I ended up with no money. Mm. Like I had left television and I took this program out and it wouldn't work. So I used to use magic as a cameraman as a way to build rapport with people because get this, apparently people don't trust the media. <gasps> I know. So I always found out bringing a couple of magic tricks out and being able to do them. Sometimes, you know, you get, you know, make the kids laugh, the, the people would be happier and it was just easier to do your job. So <laughs> I knew a few basic uh, magic tricks and I just had to double down and learn a lot and I learned enough to become a professional magician. Uh, I mainly did family and children's audiences. I did 2000 magic shows over about uh, a five year period. And uh, that led on to, to other things. But what it, it, it led me on to having a YouTube channel that did really well in its time. So it got 30 million views, still got 140,000 subscribers. I haven't, I haven't even been on it 
in about six or seven years. Uh, and we can talk about that. I learned so much about that side and and what keeping, uh, you know, what actually creating a YouTube channel entails. But the great thing about that is it, it opening up to metrics. And I'm not a numbers person, but in the basic metrics, I looked and there was a spike and it was this really unusual spike because this YouTube channel was primarily primarily for children. But here was a spike of males, 35 to 55 years old, from USA, from Great Britain, from Poland, all around the world. There were these older men watching this. So I reached out to them and said, who are you? What are you watching this for? And I got 33,000 words back from them in a, a little word, uh, you know, a word count on it. And these people told me these stories. They said, you know what? All my life, I've wanted to be a professional magician, a professional kids entertainer. I know some tricks, but I don't know the glue to go between them to make a magic show. And you teach that so well and you teach the confidence. And so I said to them, you know, like, um, if I build a course and I called it Build Your Magic Show, would you buy it? And enough people showed enough interest that I built this course, my first online course called Build Your Magic Show. Uh, it did well in the world of magic, uh, but it had a limited market. But that led me on to creating a company with somebody from the United Kingdom, and we created the world's first online training academy for professional children's entertainers. It's called the Kids Entertainer Academy. We ran that for about three years, and we were able to sell it as a going business. Now, I'm not talking sheep stations, like it was not huge numbers, but we created and sold a working business. And then I left from that, and because even though we taught you know magic skills and balloon twisting and juggling we were really teaching personal transformation how to take people from feeling stuck to being unstuck and all i did with that once i sold that is i took the magic off the top of that and i put video which i knew a lot about and this is when we were coming into COVID had started and everyone was going we needed to show up on on video and I ran with that for about three and a half to four years. I've taken video off the top of that now, and I've put on change back on the top. So it's all about personal transformation. But I just sort of told you that story in this, just to tell you, you don't know where things are going to go. And these skills that you're learning now with whatever online you know business that, that you're running, they might not work how you think they're going to work right now. But you don't know in three years time how valuable they could be for you. So uh, don't expect immediate results. It's wonderful if, if, if you get them. Uh, but this, this can play out in ways that you never imagined. Absolutely. I quite like that. And um, such, a, such a very, very in-depth um you know response and there's so much to pick up from that but i wanted to find out so with the philanthropy side of things sorry i'm taking you back a little bit there yeah what 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 is it exactly where you teaching kids were you teaching kids to be givers or were you teaching kid or were you wanting them to um have an understanding of what what it means to to give and be of contribution to society so when I was a cameraman, we would be setting up interviews and quite often as you're setting up lights and microphones and that, it's a bit of dead time. So you get into small talk with the talent, with the person that you're interviewing. And quite often these were people, they might have been captains of industry. They might have been the CEO of a bank. They might have been a politician. They might have been a sports star. And I had done a documentary on philanthropy. So I was just interested in the whole concept. And I used to ask these people, what are you going to do about with, around philanthropy? And the common response, I always got, oh, yeah, I'm thinking about doing something, you know, about that when I'm retiring. And I used to think, oh, no, 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 you've got, 
you're in a position where you can affect change. Like you've got your hands on the levers now. You can be doing so much more. And I had these conversations over and over and over again. And I realized you couldn't teach the old dogs new tricks. So I thought, can I teach young pups new tricks? So I just got this idea. Could I teach the concept of philanthropy to a new generation? And so it was based around this program. It's called the Thumb Program, T-H-U-M-B. And it was based around a non-visual gesture. Now, I'm just going to take a little sidebar here and tell you why non-visual gestures work so well. As a cameraman, there used to be, you know, the Channel 7 network in Australia. For decades, they had a promotion where they would get people, if they ever saw a camera, to go their hands, five fingers out, then two fingers out, so seven, five and two. This was this non-visual gesture. So it was saying, you know, seven. And everywhere, people would come around. If you had a home movie camera, or people would come up and stick their hands in front of the camera. That finished and still a decade later when I was out there people would just come up in the street and do this in front of the camera and I went wow there's real power in a non-verbal gesture so if I'm going to create messages I create them around non-verbal gestures now so the thumb program was t-h-u-m-b and you count start with your thumb the t is for think of others help when you can Use your noggin to make your school a better place. T-H-U-M-B. And that's basically the process of philanthropy. Because, uh, 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 oh, uh, <laughs> a simple word I've completely forgotten has gone from my head. Uh, uh, when, when we give a charity, <laughs> I couldn't think of the word. So, I mean, charity is we just give, you know, we, we, we all just give a little bit of, of money and, and somebody goes off and does something with that. But if we were to take a larger amount of money and strategically try to apply it to the root cause of a problem, we can often affect much greater change. So I'd go into the schools and I would tell these kids, okay, imagine you had a concrete path that was going into the school and it had a, you know, a bit of a, a lip or an edge on it and kids were always falling over and skinning their knees. What could we do about it? Well, we could you know, all bring in some you know, sticking plasters, band-aids and, and just put them on the, on the kids' knees. Is there something else we could do? What about if we had at your school fate, we had a jumble sale, you all brought in toys you didn't want and we were able to raise, let's say $500. What could we do with that? Well, we could take our five hundred dollars and get you know parents to come in on a working bee on the weekend, and we could buy some cement, we could buy some you know sand and all that, and with the parents, and we could fix the path. Therefore, when the kids come in, there's no problem anymore. So this was the simple concept of teaching this idea of philanthropy to kids, and the schools I did it with really liked it. But again, there was no interest or real desire or, or pull for this. But that, that's, uh, yeah, that's why I walked away. I thought it was going to change the world, Prosper, and well, I didn't. <laughs> well, I think, I think maybe had you stuck with it a little bit, um, it would have actually maybe helped a lot of people because so many things like taxes, so many things like... Um, you know, just communication, love. It's not taught in schools, let alone things that will literally help people, um, you know, make this world a better place. This is not things that are literally taught in schools. It just may have needed a little bit more push. But like you said, you ran out of money. Um, you know, it, 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 it really is something that is needed. And I'm thinking, hey, if you can ever put yourself into a position where this can be a thing. Again, I think the thump method can actually have advocates within schools without you necessarily going around and doing that. Because if we can empower each and every kid to make this world a better place, it's not necessarily just giving other people money or anything else, but just really living the world the way you would have wanted to find it. I think that's a noble cause. And, 
strategically I completely agree with you I'll just tell you something tactically if anyone's listening and you're thinking maybe you wanted to do something with schools I'll tell you what what I learned from that time so two um, two 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 things one if you want to connect with the school it's very very hard you have to get past the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper keeper is the people on reception if you get through and you get through to a teacher here's the thing about teachers they never empty their inboxes so you might get through and get an email and it just bounces so let's say you finally get through to the right people do you know what teachers really really want they want you to be able to go on stage and teach part of the curriculum so they can have 45 minutes to an hour where they can sit in the back of the hall and mark. <laughs> that's what they want. And so that's why I'm saying that you, that you need to somehow structure it, that you key in to their key curriculum needs. Because without it, you are just going to have a lot of trouble these days. But Julian, all right, I'm going to challenge you a little bit more again. This stop method needs to exist, all right? The reason why I'm saying that is you already know how to work YouTube. And you you were about to tell me how you did that. You don't necessarily need to go door knocking in the schools. You literally can actually start creating this for those that might um, be able to listen. And I feel like if there's a way that education can be slipped into what is being offered in our schools these days, you would have done something to make this world a better place, just like you want to teach the kids. Yeah, you know, like, so using YouTube is, is a, like, it's just a wonderful tool that we've got. I mean, if I look back to 20 years ago before YouTube was around, and if you told me <laughs> that we could each have our own private channels and blast it out into the world, and you know what? It's not going to cost us a cent to actually run that. I would have laughed at you, but here we are. So all that said, YouTube is a hungry, hungry monster. And if you want to make YouTube work for you, you have to go in for the long haul. And here's how I know that. I built my channel called Julian's Magician School, where um, you know, I used to every, every week uh, put a, a, a fairly high quality video up teaching these basic tricks and uh, presentation skills behind it. And I did that for first year, for second year and into the third year. And it was just incremental. Like I could count the number of subscribers in a week on one hand who would come to my channel. And I kept doing it and I kept doing it. And I woke up one morning and I literally had to rub my eyes. There was a spike and I had one video that the algorithm had chosen and got right. We're just going to run with that on the first page of when you typed in magic tricks, it came up. Once the floodgates were opened, I tell you, it is a feeling like I've I rarely felt before. It is like you are literally sitting there watching the counter turn over and it goes up. So this rose up and I thought I am just on it. And I was making, you know, some money from the, uh, the uh, AdWords out of it. Uh, and I was reaching way more people. But here's the thing. After about three and a half years, I was exhausted of doing this every week and I was running out of content. So I made a decision that I was going to stop. And so I made a video explaining to people what I was doing. And, and I had really good engagement, really good engagement. And I can show you my, my metrics graph of my YouTube channel over three and a half to four years of building up and then spiking up. And it's literally a mirror image <laughs> the other side. If you don't feed the hungry monster, YouTube drops you. So if you're using this, uh, your strategy is to use YouTube, you've got to be in this for the long haul because as soon as you stop feeding it, uh, it'll drop you. And then the next thing is what all really successful YouTubers won't admit to you is how much luck played a big part because there are so many people out there who are equally uh, entitled, uh, talented, or whatever as I, but they never had a successful YouTube channel. I just got lucky because you know that video that I said the algorithm picked up? 
Yeah. I reckon it was one of my worst, stupidest video. But for whatever reason, the algorithm got behind that and it literally like the gates were, were opened. Now, I've had other YouTube um, channels and other podcasts where I've tried to replicate that. Can't replicate that luck. So, you know, and, and that, that um, level of engagement. And so if people tell you, that, you know, just, you know, really straight, or you need to do this and you just need to do that, what they're not telling you is about how the luck went their way. Now, of course, you make your own luck. I worked hard. I was prepared. But it could have easily not gone my way. And you have to factor this in. And you have to factor this in for your business strategy. And you have to factor this in for your personal well-being. Because if you walk away from this thinking, you know, I work really hard and I'm a failure. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. It didn't go your way this time. But everything that you've learned and done now, like you have no idea how I don't know. It could be two years. It could be five years. It could be 10 years. We go, oh, thank goodness I did that. That is so valuable now. None of this is wasted. Absolutely. I quite like that. And um, I also like the fact that you've, um, you've got this ability to distill really complex concepts. And um, that's the reason why leaders need to have you as their keynote speaker. What would be the best way that people can get a hold of you so that um, you know, you can work with them and have them understand a few things um, because you've literally have had more changes than a baby in a coffee drinking concert, right? Yeah, I actually had that as a baby in a beer drinking con contest, but I got a lot of people who got, you know, shouldn't say a beer drinking contest. So it's a coffee drinking contest now. <laughs> uh, uh, www.julianmather.com. J U L I A N M A T H E R dot com. If you go there, you will clearly know what I do within about 60 seconds, and you want to know whether you want to take it to the next step. Absolutely. You see, one of the things that you led with is people are not taught how to change. And uh, yeah. as you would understand, if we were living in the same world, the last sort of four years have been a total change for a lot of people, starting with the first two, when everybody else was told they were non-essential, which then presented a big change in the way they worked, where they lived, and how they actually survived now as we navigate through the winds of change and now we've got ai in our midst it's going to be harder and harder for people to sort of stand out and things of that nature what's one piece of wisdom that you'd maybe offer to individuals and businesses just striving to adapt to to do the change that's coming in in, in today's dynamic landscape so I would say this is something that there was an American writer named Alvin Toffler and he wrote, he was a futurist and he wrote this in 1970. So this guy was ahead of the curve. He said the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write. It will be those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. And if you want anything to take away from this is that if you think that you've left school or you've left work or you've left college and your learning ends, that's actually when it starts. You should now just be learning and then going, right, I got to learn something new and learn it, uh, new stuff again. It is the way of the future. And it's actually going to benefit you because generalists will be the new specialists. So there will always be specialists, and you know, I'm, I want a specialist brain surgeon. Don't 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 get me wrong there, but in so much out in the workplace there now, things are changing so fast, particularly with technology. If you can be someone who's very good at learning, unlearning, and relearning, you will be seen as this specialist generalist that they can call in and go, "We want this done," and you go, "No problem, I'm onto it." Fantastic. Now, Julian, I can't thank you enough for the time that we've spent on the call today, but it would be remiss for me to ask this. All right. So you've been a sniper, you've been a magician and the guy behind the camera doing keynotes now, attempted at phil philanthropy teaching and had a YouTube uh, success stint. What's next? What can people expect 
from um, Julian in the future? Uh, I'm just happy right at the moment. I, so uh, what, what, what I do is I generally work in five-year blocks, five to ten-year blocks, which is a very good thing to just go out on. People think it's all going to happen to tomorrow. I never, when I put change in process, expect something to happen for about five years. I mean, you know, things you, you have to have improvement along the, the way. But realistically, everyone I've seen out there who's done impressive things work in five and ten-year blocks. So um, for the next five or 10 years, Prosper, you expect to see me out there talking uh, and uh, getting better at it and really loving it. Uh, and then I don't know. I don't know what the next thing would be, but I have no concept of retirement. I'll tell you that. So it'll be something. Maybe we can come back and do the 10-year anniversary and find out. I'd love that. I'd love to find out what else has been happening another question that i think will be remiss for me to ask i mean we were introduced to an eight-year-old um boy that was stuttering who ended up telling the world's richest person to stay in his lane what would you tell that kid if you had an opportunity to give him a word of advice uh i did not to change any anything absolutely not to change anything everything valuable in my life has come from the mistakes that I've made. You, you, and it's just getting up, uh, dusting yourself off and you know making another mistake and learning. It's about not making the same mistake twice. It's not about being down, it's about getting up after you're down. So you know, no, I, I wouldn't tell myself to do anything differently. And anyone listening, I would tell you, you the way you're doing it is the right way. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's zigzag. Don't don't expect a straight line. Expect this zigzag through life. Uh, it's more realistic and it's way more interesting. Absolutely, I quite love that. And there you have it, folks. That was Julian Mother, the master of metamorphosis in my own eyes. Here, he's left us spellbound with his tales of adventure and transformation. And my favorite part is when you told Elon Musk, "Hey." I just need 30 minutes of your time. You're just as human as I am. So if you found this episode as captivating as I did, be sure to hit the subscribe button and join us for more enriching conversations on the online prosperity show. I'll make sure that all the links that Julian referred us to will be in the show notes below. Until next time, keep embracing change and writing your own extraordinary story. Like Julian says, don't change whatever is happening to you right now. Bye for now.